Welcome to Rework, a podcast by 37 Signals about the better way to work and run your business. I'm joined by the co-founders of 37 Signals, Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. You know their company, 37 Signals, as the makers of Basecamp project management software. These two know project management from the inside out, but they also know that not all projects always go according to plan. Jason and David are here to talk about that, how to know when a project is off the rails and how to get it back. Jason, I'm gonna start with you. You recently wrote about a construction project with one of your friends, kind of tell us about that. Yeah, so a buddy of mine is, well started by um, repairing a little crack in his uh, kitchen counter, I think it was. Um, and so he hired a handyman to do that. And they started fixing that And then his wife said, why don't we just do the backsplash too? And so they added that on. And as that was happening, the the handyman goes, you know, I could do your lights too. And before you know it, like this just small repair turned into many projects. And my friend called me like not crying, but kind of like just completely lost. Like my house is a complete disaster. Nothing's getting done. Uh, I don't know when this is going to end. And he he'd never been involved in a project like this. I, I've done a few house renovations, so you know I, I'm like, okay, well, this is kind of normal. It's kind of a mess for a while, but but let's talk about what's going on. And basically, he just kept explaining that he kept adding on projects, and I kept asking him, "Well, is anything done, or you just keep adding more stuff?" And he's like, "I just keep adding more stuff." The guy's like, "It'll be done in a few more days," and and, and I said, "Okay, we need to stop here. We need to slow down." And let's take stock of what's going on. And we kind of went through that process. And then I said, okay, the first thing you got to do is you got to finish something. You cannot leave all these things open and start adding more things on. And uh, that was sort of a revelation to him, um, like that, that you actually had to finish one thing before you can start something else. And this is actually pretty common um, in software development too, and, and all sorts of things where people just keep layering on more stuff and they wonder why nothing gets done. It's because you never finish anything. You just start, you keep starting things. And so he just wasn't used to that. So I kind of laid that out for him and it really helped. And and then, you know, we kind of finish something 100%, get that out of the way so it's off the table, completely done. Then you move on to the next most important thing. And that was the only way that sort of saved the project, essentially. Otherwise, I think it would have kept spiraling out of control. And then you get more frustrated and then you, you demand more. And what you don't realize is that you created the problems. The general contractor or a handyman or whoever, they didn't really, they're just looking for work. You're giving them work. And then you're wondering why there's so much stuff going on and nothing's getting done. And that's it's because of you, frankly. So that was a a bit of the story there. I think the parallel here to all kinds of project management, including the stuff that we do at 37 Signals, is just spot on. One of the reasons why we instituted shape up as a described method and this focus on having budgets instead of estimates and having cycles that end after six weeks was exactly to combat this phenomenon that it's so easy to kick things off. It's so easy to start more things. It's so easy to say, hey, couldn't you just real quick also have a look at this? And there there are no real quicks. There are a bunch of people who will do what you tell them to do if you're paying them. And then they'll just start thrashing, jumping from one thing to another. And as with construction projects, so go software development. You can't do two things at once. You can try, which basically just means you're jumping from one thing to the other and back again. And every time you do that jump, you lose a little bit. You lose a little bit of attention, you lose a little bit of context, you lose a large bit of progress and momentum. So when you think set things up in the sense that, you know what, we're just going to clear the tables entirely every six weeks as we do, you put yourself in a position or you vaccinate yourself against having this accumulation of unfinished stuff that's almost sort of kind of done, but not really. This is the other project or problem here with these kinds of projects. It feels often quite easy to get to 90% done. And then there's just the last 10%. And if you keep having projects that all miss those last 10%, It's just an absolute drain on your attention and your ability to focus on what's in front of you. You have to clear the decks. You have to wipe the slate clean and like, okay, now we're deciding what we're going to do with 100% of our time for this next duration that we're going to be working on. If you're like, oh, well, we're deciding what to do with like uh, 43% of our attention because that's what's left when we account to all these other things. 
it's not a good time. It's kind of this sense of like you're constantly paying the debt of past decisions. And when you do that, you just you don't have all of it to spend on, on the best decisions you could possibly make today. So having some regiment, a forcing function that enables you to clear the decks by saying like that's simply our process, I think is a really good way to push back against this natural human instinct of wanting to start new stuff all the time. The other thing to add too is when you pick something to finish, you can't add anything new until all the other stuff that's undone is done. I think that's another really important thing because otherwise you're gonna fall right back into the pattern of just adding more things on. And as David mentioned about like getting the first 90% done is relatively easy. There's some saying, and I don't know what percentage of the saying is, but it's like something like the last 10% is half the work or something like that. And it could be the last 5% is half the work, but it turns out to be true, which is why anyone who's ever built a house or renovated something has this punch list at the end of unfinished business, things that need to be dealt with, and it never seems to end. There's just projects go on and on and on naturally. So you really, if you keep adding more things, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. You really gotta pick something, finish it, and not add anything new until it's all done. I think the other reason for that is the sense of accomplishment that comes from truly finishing something. In software for us, that comes, that line is when you ship it when customers are actually allowed to use the thing you built, you have to be done or done enough, right? Like you're never truly done, but that's that's part of the magic here of doing product management or project management in general is deciding when you're done. Like there's no such thing as an objective done, even with a house, as Jason say, there are almost any house you will work on, there will always be a punch list. At some point, like there's a handover and you say like, hey, it's done enough that we're shipping it. And I think this comes in very often in software as well, that if you don't have the forcing function and if you work with estimates instead of budgets, you're so inclined to constantly think, yeah, just a little more. Let's just get it a little better. Let's just get it a little more polished. Let's just add a few more things into it. And what's so interesting about that cycle is that it kind of feeds on itself in terms of your confidence in your ability to ship anything. So. In some software organizations that work with estimates and that work with sort of commitment, we've said we're going to build this and we're going to build exactly this, you end up in a situation where you ship quite rarely. And then there's even more pressure to jam every idea you could possibly have into the current project because that's the only ship that's actually sailing. If you come into port every six weeks and you allow the people who make the decisions to pick a new direction, you will build up confidence that, you know what, I get to change my mind. I get to set sails for a new place. We're not just eternally stuck here. I don't have to cram everything into this one ship because that's my one shot at getting somewhere. You actually get to change your mind. And I think that, interestingly enough, lowers the um, incentives to layer on all this multitasking. It lowers the incentives to say, can't you also just do this thing really quick for me? Because you know, there's going to be an opportunity where you get to do that. Um, and if you can build that trust both ways, I think you end up in a, such a better situation where A, you allow the builders and the makers to finish things. That feels really good. Builders and makers generally love shipping finished stuff. That's a sense of accomplishments. And you build confidence in the people provisioning or commissioning that work to know that, you know what, I'm going to get another shot. I'm going to get another chance of, of doing this and I will actually see things being finished. So many organizations end up in this dysfunctional, low trust environment where you think you have to hustle to get things in because everything takes forever. Well, I'm curious because, Jason, it sounds like when your friend reached out, it was kind of a desperate situation, like things were had been wrong for a while. So I'm curious from your perspective in project management and especially with software development, like how can you tell things are going off the rails before they're way too late? I mean, I've heard stories of like, oh, yeah, we're two months behind on this project. Well, surely you knew that before today. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, you know, interestingly enough, he didn't know that. So he, he didn't. He just. He'd never been through a project like this, had never really done a, a big project. And so he felt like this is just sort of the way it was. But then at some point, you feel something different. Something clicks in. It's 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 a sense of desperation, like, wow, or this this is over my head. He kept saying, like, I think I'm in over my head, is how he said it, which is a feeling. 
it's not a fact, really. I mean, it kind of is, but there's no dividing line or demarcation when it becomes a fact and it wasn't a fact before, but it's a feeling. And I think that's part of it. You have to pay attention to projects. You, you, you know, uh, you get to be two months late, you know, what do they say, one day at a time or however you want to put it, but there's a feeling like we're just, there's, this is not moving fast enough or why is this taking so long? Um, again, it's not like it didn't yesterday and it does today. It, it, it's it's a culmination of something that's bubbling up, and I think you need to to uh, be tuned into it. And so I think you know it's I don't know how to <clears throat> give people like uh, a, a how to, how to guide people into being tuned into it. But I think when you pay attention to these things and you're a bit impatient uh, and and you're really close to the work, you know, you just know, and and that maybe is just experience, but it is something you have to know and feel. I, I don't think it's like a a, a, ch a number of checklists. It's not like you should be 30% done by this time. Or I, I'm not into that kind of objective measurement because I don't, what is it? If you're 29%, then it's okay. It, no, it's still wrong. Something is wrong. It's a feeling. I think the major red flag for me is actually not when you realize you're in trouble, but when you set out to see. If you start a project going, hey, this is a six month project or a nine month project, when it comes to product development, um, you're probably in trouble. If you're trying to make um, sort of precise estimates or even worse commitments about something speculative, like many, many months into the future, you've signed up for failure in almost all cases when it comes to software development. Some card parts of construction are a little different, but I've also been through a, prob uh, a handful of construction projects and they're not actually that different. Like people often have this illusion of thinking like, oh, do you know what? Uh, building a house is a, a thing we figured out totally. We've been building houses for thousands of years. This is a not a novel thing anymore. And maybe that's true if you're building like, I don't know, row houses where you've already built a thousand of exactly the same thing. But a lot of houses are at least partially bespoke. And at any point where you're into bespoke development, and that's usually virtually all of software development, there's just that level of uncertainty. You can't be entirely sure how long something is going to take. So if you submit to that and go like, well, I want this big complicated thing, this big complicated thing, this cathedral is going to take in software terms, maybe two years. I'm going to set off sales on the two year thing. And, and now today it's uh, July uh, 19, 2023. We're going to be done July 21st, 2025. You've already failed. Like I can tell you on day one, that is going to be a failure. There is no chance that you're going to ship exactly what you wanted two years into the future because no one is that good. No one has that level of oversight into all the things that come up during the spoke, bespoke development. The only possible way you can hit a deadline like that is to not really make it a real deadline, is to make it a budget. We have this amount of time. We will ship whatever is finished at that time. Those things never go hand in hand, I find, though. The longer, the more complicated the project, the more deceivingly specific people believe they can be when the opposite should actually be true. We sometimes set off on multi-year projects. For example, when we built Hay, Hay took about two years to build. When we set sail for that, first of all, we did not set like a deadline. This is when it's going to be done. Second of all, we had a very vague, fuzzy idea of what we're building. Yeah, we're building an email client, but there's about five trillion permutations of what that exactly could be. And we let that be explicitly open from the get go. You really get into trouble when you try to specify upfront in any delicate amount of detail what you're going to build for the long term. So for us, again, coming back to shape up in software, the easiest counter to this is just not to give yourself so much time. Like it's, it's to hold the rope tight such that it can never slack so long that you'll you hang yourself with it. So we give ourselves on all normal feature development the six weeks, right? And we're off even on six weeks. We're very often off by at least a week, um, sometimes even two weeks. And you can just go like, it gets exponentially harder, the more complicated and the longer the project runs. So if we're off with like 20 years of experience, really being delicate about building something just in six week increments, how off do you think most software teams are gonna be if they try to specify something six months into the future? They're always off. This is why sort of the history of large software development, particularly the kind of stuff that happens in governmental or large business commissions where you get someone else to build it and you think, oh, if we have an ironclad contract up front, then surely they will build exactly this, is a history of just total failure. 
most large software projects fail. They have failed through history and we've gotten no better at building large software projects in the entire history of software. And to some extent, maybe we've gotten worse. I'll give one brief example. So in Denmark, they're working on this um, unified system for setting um, tax assessments of properties. They are eight years over schedule and I think 50 times it is currently going or it has currently cost because this thing is never going to be finished, by the way, which is an interesting assessment in itself. It's cost over a billion dollars and it was, I think, estimated to be something like 300 million when they started on. Like you're eight years overdue, you're a billion dollars well into it, right? And it's never going to be finished. Like the only thing you were waiting on in the Danish society is for them to admit that, which is this is other problem, right? As you say, when do you know that you failed? When do you know that you're off track? Usually very far in advance of when you do something about it, because hope springs eternal. Humans are sort of built to believe, no, 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 no. Next week is when we're going to catch up. But as Jason say, it never happens. You never catch up. It never happens because you're late one day at a time. You can only fix that one day at a time. You can't suddenly leap jump. And if you were, <laughs> this is the funny thing. If you start out on a complicated project, right? And you get late one day at a time in the beginning, right? That was the easy time. The easiest time to stay on track was the initial phase of it. It only gets harder from here. So if you're already, let's say, halfway through, and usually if you think you're halfway through, you're only at best a quarter through on a big project, um, it's only going to get harder. So you're only going to get more late. So this sense where the lag factor is of like, I actually know I'm, as Jason's friend would say, in over my head and like, I'm going to do something about it. That's usually the main tension. The one that gets me frustrated is when the people working on the project, they know it's not going to be finished. But we all sort of pretend that like maybe we're going to catch up next week. No, you're not. It, to add one more quick thing to that, the other problem with long projects is that you get more time to um, not fix the problem. <laughs> like you wait, you wait, you, you'll wait until you like you won't early like David, you won't get to the problem early because you have more time that you think you're going to fix it and then you don't but you put off fixing it for way too long which is way worse and but that's that's the luxury of having space and time like oh we'll deal with it later there's nothing easier than going yeah later yeah later i mean that's like so easy it's the easiest thing to do because there's no obligation and you can end the discussion yeah yeah we'll deal with that later and then it's you know way too late um, and then you've piled up all the stuff when you have no time. It's, it's, it's usually, this is why people run into these issues like at the end of things also is because they just didn't deal with them early enough. So yeah, it's, it's complicated. I think what's funny about this is also sometimes the language we use. Jason, you just use the term that people do all the time. We have the luxury of time and space. We have the luxury of a lot of it. No, you don't. You have to curse of too much time. You have to curse of too much space and too many resources and so on. The luxury is actually in the constraints. The luxury is actually in hard, fast boundaries that force you to come up with creative solutions to problems that would take too long if you were going to solve them the quote unquote normal way or the long way or the luxurious way, right? It is actually much better to have the luxury of not enough. That is the sweet spot of creative problem solving in any endeavor. And I think particularly in project management, you want to recognize upfront you don't have enough. And I think this is what's such a fundamental mental shift in the shape up approach that we go from these estimates. Hey, how long is it's going to take to build X, Y and Z to say, do you know what? <laughs> There's no way to specify in sufficient detail how long it's going to take to build X, Y and Z and then do it within the time we thought it would take. That never happens, even in the best of projects, even on the shortest amount of time. The only way to ship something on time is to say, yeah, we know building X, Y and Z is going to take longer than we thought. Um, we just don't have that long. So as we're building X, Y and Z are all not equally important. X is the epicenter of the problem. That is what we have to fix and have to build in order to ship. So we will start there first and we'll see how much of Y and Z we get to. But no matter what, we are shipping on August 10th. That works and cuts with the grain of human nature. We know how to do this. This is one of the reasons that procrastination is such a universally felt 
emotion and driver of actual progress when you're like, holy shit, I've been procrastinating the entire semester to turn in my long run paper. Now it's the last week. I better get to it. And then suddenly you find these immensely deep reservoirs of motivation and productivity and so on to do it. You can also just be there or thereabouts from the get go, realizing up front that there's not enough time. You have to make cuts. You're not going to get all of it. And that's fine. You're going to get something good. I also feel like sometimes people think I'm going to rescue this project by checking in on it every day. And we you know, hear of people doing like these daily check in and daily stand up meetings. And that's how I'm going to track the progress and make sure we're on track. I know at 37 Signals, we don't do a lot of meetings. Kind of tell, talk me through that of how you're keeping track of status without the need for all of this. Like I'm going to check in on it every day. We're going to all get in a room and talk through it, see where everybody is. Yeah, I mean, that, that can slow things down quite a bit, too. But it's also this false sense of security and, and confidence that, well, as long as I know everything that's going on, we're going to be all right. Like, well, you might know everything that's going on is wrong. Uh, now, you could say, like, well, that's good, right? Well, you don't need to know that every single day either. Like, you, can, it's too often. It's far too often to, to actually be able to spot things that are going wrong every single day. It just, it's not the right cadence actually to figure it out because not enough time for things to go wrong really on a daily basis. Or you're, you're picking out stuff that's going wrong that isn't really wrong. It's just, it's, it's, it's just happening and it'll be done tomorrow and it's not a big deal in the first place. But then you overemphasize things that are, quote, wrong that aren't actually wrong. So I think that, that degree of meeting cadence is way too often. Um, I've been involved with, with projects where, like construction projects, where we do a standing meeting once a week every Wednesday for like an hour to catch up a variety of different trades on some things. And I think there's some value in that in specific kinds of projects, um, but daily way too much, uh, way too often. And also it's, it's too, you're almost too zoom, zoomed in to really see the big picture of what's going on here and what's taking so long. I think it also gives you the false confidence that you can actually make micro adjustments that often when what you're doing is really just sawing at the wheel. Like there's a saying in, uh, in in racing that when you take a turn, you got to do it in one smooth movement. The uncertain driver will be constantly, and that includes me, by the way, my driving style is a little like this, will be constantly sawing at the wheel, constantly trying to make these micro adjustments, right? And you end up going slower. You end up going slower than just taking like one solid turn at it and then uh, coming through on the other side. And secondly of all, this is what everyone hates about managers. If you ask any builder, it is having this nagging person on you constantly beating you for, where are you? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? You're like, dude, I fucking just answered you yesterday. Just chill out and let me actually do the thing you're so worried about us not doing. Your constant interruptions is slowing that down. And there's this sense that like, if I'm sawing at the wheel, if I'm doing something, anything, I'm like, I'm in control. No, you're not. You're causing the thing to get out of control. If you would just back off and as Jason say, maybe you do a thing once a week. Maybe you don't even do that. I mean, for a lot of our projects, the way we quote unquote check in on them is asynchronously from a distance. The people working on the project, they might use the daily check in questions. What have you worked on today that we use a bunch? Or they might use a feature based camp called Hill Charts where they update on their own accord. Like this is where we are. And interested parties can kind of just watch from afar. And I find that kind of accepting those constraints as a manager, as a stakeholder in a project who might be very eager to get this thing finished. Um, is is really good. You have to know that the observer effect, the Hawthorne effect in this instant is usually net negative if the cadence is, is too high. Now, you can also flip too far the other way and like you're not paying attention and people get the sense that there's no urgency and so on. There has to be some injection of urgency, but I think it's easier to overdo it than it is to underdo it. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up. I will link to uh, Jason's write-up on his Hey World, as well as a couple of podcast episodes. Um, estimates, your estimates suck is another one that I feel like is appropriate for this episode. So we'll link all of that in our show notes. Rework is a production of 37 Signals. You can find show notes and transcripts on our website at 37signals.com slash podcast. Full video episodes are also available on YouTube and Twitter. And if you have a question for Jason or David about a better way to work and run your business, leave us a voicemail at 708-628-7850 and we just might answer it on an upcoming show. 